This module begins a five-part section devoted to the IFRS framework. In this, the opening module of the section, we will be focusing on the role of the regulatory framework that underpins financial reporting. In later modules of the section, we will shift our attention to the conceptual framework and the qualitative characteristics of financial information, the elements of financial statements where we discuss the definitions and recognition criteria for the principal building blocks of financial reporting, such as assets and liabilities, or income and losses, and finally, the different measurement bases that are used and applied in the process of preparing finance. So, let's focus on what a framework actually is. In general terms, a framework may be understood as a basic structure underlying a particular system. You may think of a framework as a tool for putting information in order, a tool for avoiding chaos. In the context of financial reporting, the term framework can be used in two different ways. On the one hand, it may describe the institutional setup in which international financial reporting standards are prepared, approved and applied. This is the so-called regulatory or institutional framework, which embraces the IFRS standard setting process and the general legal context in which IFRS standards are used. On the other hand, we can speak of a conceptual framework that is a set of generally accepted theoretical principles which should be kept in mind when designing new accounting standards or when applying them in practice. In this module, we will be focusing on the regulatory framework, in other words, the first of the two interpretations or meanings listed. The conceptual framework, which in the case of IFRS is put together in a formal document, the conceptual framework for financial reporting, will be the topic of the next module. When we consider the legal environment in which companies operate, we can typically identify at least a couple of elements usually in place and which tend to impact companies' accounting and financial reporting processes. These are national laws, including general regulations such as the civil code, European Union or other supranational regulations, for example, in the form of published directives, securities exchange rules, tax regulations, and finally, accounting principles, including local accounting standards. All of the regulations listed make up the regulatory framework in which companies operate and it is important to appreciate that accounting standards are just one of the elements of that framework. In the context of financial reporting, the goal of regulation is to ensure that users of financial statements receive information which is good enough to enable them to make sensible economic decisions. That is information which possesses certain qualitative characteristics which we will be discussing in detail in the next module. When considering the broad regulatory framework which embraces all of the regulation that impacts financial reporting, it is important to realize that there are strong tendencies for accounting regulation from around the world to become unified and harmonized. As you can probably imagine, harmonization brings about multiple benefits. Many multinational companies operate on a global scale, and if financial information coming from different countries is prepared on a consistent basis, it makes reading and interpreting the numbers and generally doing business a lot easier. The preparation of financial information for various stakeholders uses up less resources if it can be done using the same principles in different places. Also, consolidating the results coming from different parts of a multinational company becomes easier if all countries follow the same rules. For investors, Harmonization makes it easier to compare different entities and make fully informed investment decisions. And finally, 
from the perspective of tax authorities, harmonization makes it easier to control tax statements, therefore limiting tax avoidance. At the same time, there still exist considerable barriers that make the full harmonization of accounting standards an improbable, if not impossible, task. Individual countries typically have their own social, political ends, which can prevent full harmonization. Furthermore, the legal systems of different countries vary widely, so some harmonized solutions are not easily transferable to all countries concerned. One point of particular contention is typically the relationship between accounting and tax regulations, which is often set up differently across jurisdictions. And finally, let's not lose track of the fact that developing a full set of harmonized accounting rules and making companies adopt them is a very costly process, and those high initial costs often overshadow the future benefits which harmonization is expected to bring. The regulatory framework in which international financial reporting standards exist and function naturally also includes the various institutions involved in the standard setting process. Although detailed knowledge of these institutions may not really be a necessary condition for understanding and applying the standards in practice, it may prove useful if you are, for example, researching a standard which is still being worked on, or perhaps looking for more detailed guidance on specific financial reporting issues. The four institutions which are at the very heart of the IFRS standard setting process are the International Accounting Standards Board, known as the IASB, the International Financial Reporting Standards Foundation, also known as simply the IFRS Foundation, the IFRS Interpretations Committee or IFRS IC, and last of all, the IFRS Advisory Council, abbreviated to IFRS AC. Let's start with the IASB, which is at the very center of the standard setting process, having sole responsibility for issuing International Financial Reporting Standards, or IFRS. The goal of the IASB is to develop a single set of high-quality, understandable and enforceable accounting standards. Having said this, the IASB lacks the legal authority to enforce compliance with the standards that it develops, making it necessary to cooperate closely with national authorities. To make this process more efficient, representatives of national standard setters are in fact represented on the board. The IFRS Foundation acts as a supervisory body to the IASB and is responsible for oversight and governance of the board's activities. The stated objective of the IFRS Foundation is, once again, the development of a set of global accounting standards of high quality, as well as promoting the widespread application of those standards. Next, we have the IFRS Interpretations Committee, which issues guidance on accounting topics where divergent interpretations of the standards exist, or where there are new issues which are not specifically dealt with in the standards. However, before any of the interpretations issued by the IFRS IC become binding, they first need to be approved by the IASB. And finally, we come to the IFRS Advisory Council, whose role is to provide a forum for the IASB to consult a wide spectrum of stakeholders who might be affected by the work of the board. As the final topic in this module, let's explore the typical procedure or sequence for the development of a new international financial reporting standard. It all starts when the ISB identifies a topic that should be covered and appoints a committee from its members to work on the subject. At some point, when the work reaches a stage deemed advanced enough, 
a discussion paper may be issued by the IASB to encourage comments from a wider audience. The IASB then publishes a so-called exposure draft for public comment. The exposure draft is also the first draft version of the proposed standard. And finally, following the receipt of comments, the IASB publishes the final text of the new IFRS.